Thanks for tuning in at Brackies. Hello everyone and welcome to this um, video. This is a live stream um, on creating a um, kind of uh, bubble, trouble, bubble, struggle uh, replica inside of Unity. What we're going to be making is this. And if we just hit play here, I'm just going to show you how it works. Um, we have uh, some character movement. We have a ball jumping around. And when we hit that ball using this uh, uh, chain, arrow, shooty thing, you can see that the ball splits into two. And it will keep doing that until we get to the final stage, which is, which is these little green ones. And once we uh, hit those, and you can see if, if the ball hit us, uh, the level restarts. And uh, so the goal of the game is, of course, to clear out all of the balls without getting hit yourself. And I'm really, really bad at that, that especially when uh, streaming, I just tend to crumble in terms of gameplay. I would never be able to make it as a professional gamer. So, um, but that's what we're going to be doing today. So really exciting stuff. And um, yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. So uh, let's begin by creating a new project inside of Unity. So let's go file new project. And um, I'm just gonna be naming this something like bubble struggle uh, replica and we can go and save it under my project that's fine and we'll select 2d as a standard doesn't really matter and let's also create a project there and unity is just going to go ahead and create all of the necessary files um, in order to um, make the project run in the background and i'll have a sip of water while we wait for that and again, I can see in the chat, uh, this will be on YouTube, so don't worry about that. And later we'll do a Q&A. So that's super, uh, that's going to be super fun. So we have this clear Unity pro uh, project here. And what I want to do is begin by just creating ourselves a level. So let's start by saving the scene, Control S or Command S if you're on the Mac. Let's just save this as main level. And let's also kind of sketch out what we need to have in here. We need a player, we need some balls, jumping around and we need some uh, walls to kind of encapsulate our level and maybe some kind of background as well. So in terms of uh, creating the player and the walls and the background, I wanna use very, very simple sprites for this. Actually, I just wanna use squares, which are white so that we can tint them inside of Unity. And we could just go inside of Photoshop, GIMP, go on Google search for white square. There's so much there, but I've prepared some here um, just in case. So we have a square here. And again, it's just a two by two white rectangle, really, really easy. Um, and in case it's too hard for you to create a two by two rectangle, you can always get this off GitHub later. So let's drag this inside of the project panel and then directly inside of the hierarchy. And we now have it in our scene. And this is going to act as our wall. So let's just go ahead and rename this to wall. Let's also give this a um, box collider 2D. And um, we don't want that to be trigger, but I do actually want to uh, mark it as a rigid body 2D, which is going to be kinematic. And the reason for that is uh, later when we handle collision detection, it's going to be really nice to have these marked as rigid body 2Ds because then we don't need to do it on our chain and it will make things easier. But we'll talk about that later. For now, just add this component and uh, uh, follow along with me. And uh, the next thing is, of course, uh, scaling this. So I want to give it a Y position of negative, let's say 4.5, something like that. Just make sure it's in uh, within the confines of our screen. And I also want to scale this up. So we can scale it up to maybe something like 75. It's going to look quite okay, I think. Yeah, I think that looks just fine. So we can take this wall here and we can turn it into a prefab down here. And that means that we can just easily duplicate it and we can uh, move this one up. So we're just going to do positive 4.5 and we can um, maybe uh, rename these. So this first one is going to be wall underscore bottom. You could also call it ground if you wanted to. We're going to have wall underscore top and we can duplicate this wall, wall underscore top and we can uh, rotate it by 90 degree on the Z axis. So just flip it over. So uh, make it into a side wall and we want to zero the Y and we can drag it over on the X. And I don't know exactly how much we're going to need this um, to be, but I think something like negative six is going to look fine. Yeah, that looks just fine. And then we can uh, change the scale a bit here. So maybe bump it down to, I don't know exactly how much, I think uh, 57. 
might be good actually not totally so we might need to do 0.5 that's too much that's kind of annoying uh, we can do 57 on that and we can uh, take the other ones here the top and the bottom and we can maybe adjust those let's see um, if we just need to drag those over there so that's 76 for those and that's a whole number that's a lot better something like that that looks perfect cool so we can take this uh, side wall now and we can rename that to wall left we can duplicate it rename it to wall right and then uh, flip that x position so we're just going to make this from a negative six to a positive six so now you can see we have the frame for our level and let's just see how the chat is doing you guys are being immature again i'm just going to ignore that <laughs> and then um we can uh, maybe drag in a background here as well so let's take our square drag it in as a new thing um we don't want to have this um, with any colliders or anything like that this just needs to be a sprite renderer and we can go ahead and add a sorting layer here uh, so that we will draw it behind everything else and that means that the layer needs to be drawn or placed on top because then it will be drawn first and then everything else will be placed on top of that so on the background that's awesome and then we can um, mark that as the background we can also change the color we'll do that in a sec first let's scale this up so let's just have a look at it in here see we can bump up the x whoops that's too much what was it i believe it was 76 awesome that looks good and on the y here it was 65 what was it it was six fifty-seven. jesus all right 57 uh there yeah, awesome and now when we change the color of this of course it's not going to blend together so that's perfect so we can just make it kind of a darker uh, gray and we can take our walls as well and change the color of those and i'm just going to change the color on the prefab to affect all of them directly uh, so i wanted to do kind of a, a greenish uh, feel for this one because we haven't done much with green maybe even bluish actually i want it to be kind of green and um we can take our main camera and change the background to something that looks like it so let's just first off color pick this one and you can totally uh, use this i mean that looks just fine but i want it to be a, a bit darker and less saturated just to make the uh, actual level part stand out and give it this nice edge so that already looks quite decent and i mean uh, currently we don't have any gameplay in here but that is really our environment so to say we've pretty much done everything we need to do for that so let's just rename this one to background let's also clean it up by creating a new empty object and that's just Control shift n or command shift n to create a new empty object let's reset the transform and let's call this one walls and we can take all of our four walls and drag those uh, to be a child of the walls object just to clean things up in the hierarchy it just simply looks nicer awesome uh, everything else yes this is a 2d game and um i am going to be using the uh, unity physics engine definitely and uh yeah awesome we can just go ahead and continue so the next thing that we need in here is of course some player controls so let's just go in here and i actually want to duplicate this square to create a new one and you might ask why don't we just drag in the square here and use that to create our player and the reason why is i want this square to have a pivot in the very center i want it to be anchored in the center of the square however for our player who's going to be standing on the ground i would like him to have a pivot at the very foot of the character so that when we zero him out or at least place him on here that's what the coordinate system is going to be oriented towards and uh, that's going to help us later so let's just go ahead and rename this one to player as uh, player square or something let's just do player and um in here we simply want to change the pivot from center to bottom and that's bottom center and we can hit apply and that should pretty much be it so now when we go in here you can see that our anchor is indeed down there so that's perfect and we definitely want to scale him up he's very tiny so let's do something like four on the y and two on the x that's going to look just fine we can rename him player and we can also definitely drag him down on the y here we want to place him just on top 
something like that. And he has, is actually going to have gravity, so we can place him with a bit of um, distance here, and then he will fall onto the ground once we hit play. So let's now go in here, add a box collider 2D, and that is just going to auto scale to fit, I believe. Yep, looks good. It might be hard to see on the live stream, but I can definitely see a green box there. And um, we shouldn't need to edit that, might need to string it a little bit, but that shouldn't be too much. Maybe let's just do that right away. So 0.15 on the X, 0.15 on the Y. I just think that Unity tends to exaggerate their collisions and it looks better if you shrink the colliders a tiny bit. And uh, next up, we need a rigid body. So let's do a rigid body 2D. And someone asked what the difficulty rating of this tutorial is. I would say it's somewhere between uh, beginner and intermediate, mostly beginner really. Um, we are going to be doing uh, some C-sharp scripting, of course. So if that really scares you, um, you'll just have to kind of follow along and, and take my explanation for what it is. And then you can copy my code and get it to work that way. Uh, but what we are going to be programming isn't super advanced. We're going to be instantiating. We're going to be uh, changing some positions, adding a bit of force, uh, doing a bit with triggers. And that's pretty much it. So yeah, so now we have our rigid uh, body 2D on here. And uh, let's see, we can pretty much leave all of the different values exactly as is, and we do actually want it to be dynamic as well. Sometimes with player characters, uh, you want them to use kinematics so you have full control over their movement, but we want it to react to our colliders on the side walls, and therefore I'll just leave it as dynamic. One thing that we do want to do is add some constraints because we don't want to be able to rotate on the Z. In that case, our player would be able to fall over, which would look super weird. And uh, you can also freeze the position on the Y axis, but I'm not going to be doing that because you might want to have your player on different levels. I mean, you can have, uh, say, platforms where he's able to move as well and from where he can shoot his arrow thingy and uh, that should work just fine. And I know that the uh, bubble struggle games that I played utilize that in order to create smaller distances where the uh, balls jump um, uh, to give the impression that the balls jump faster because there's not a, as much room and you you get scared and it's it's a whole crazy thing. So yeah, so uh, we'll put a constraint on only the rotation. So now when we hit play, we should see that our play just falls to the ground. Awesome, everything looks good, but we can't move him in any way. So let's go in here and add a tiny bit of movement to our player. In order to do that, let's select our player hit add component and let's create a new script called, let's just call it player actually. And some of you guys requested some cat action. And the reason for my typo there was that one of them just laid his head upon the keyboard because he fell asleep. So I just moved in over here and maybe when he wakes up, we can get him on camera. So um, awesome. So we have our player here and um, let's double click on the player script. And let's have that open up in Visual Studio. And I can see that I currently have two instances. That's something that happens um, when you create a new project. Sometimes Visual Studio won't open that. It's going to open it in a new instance. So just, yeah, remove the other one there. And we're not going to be using system.collections or uh, collections.generic. So we can just remove those. We're actually only going to be using Unity Engine. And the first thing that I want to do is create a var uh, variable uh, of type float that is going to store our player's speed. So let's just do a speed here and default it to something like four. In the original games that I played, the speed of the player was actually quite low. And that definitely made the games more difficult because you had to time it better because you weren't able to escape out of really tricky situations. You simply weren't fast enough. But I think the game just feels and plays nicer when you have a higher speed. I thought the old speed limit was a bit frustrating. So I'm just going to put it at four, which is a bit higher, but you can definitely go in and edit that uh, to suit your needs. Um, cool. So I don't think we need to do anything in the start method really, but we do need a reference to our rigid body. And we can just uh, do that by making a public rigid body 2D variable and calling it something like RB. And then when we save that, head into Unity here, um, that gives us a slot where we can then drag in that rigid body 2D. So that now means that we have a reference to this component that allows us to change things on this component and utilize its functions 
by simply referencing the RB name that we just declared. And we could call this anything, just don't call it rigid body with non-capital letters because that is a Unity shortcut that means something else. And then you're going to have a conflict and it's going to throw a weird warning and just stay away from that and call it something like RB or anything really. And uh, yeah, cool. And I'm just gonna check chat here to make sure that I'm not going totally um, off on a tangent or anything. Um, yeah, everything looks good, cool. So uh, now inside of the update method, what we will do is we will uh, gather some input. And again, we've done this before in previous live streams. Uh, Unity has a really, really easy way of getting some input. And that's using input.getaccess raw. And this basically allows us to specify whether or not we want to get input for the horizontal or the vertical axis. And uh, if we just write horizontal here, and it needs to be in quotes, this here, if we just write this, it's basically going to give us a value between minus one and one. And if it's zero, that's if the user hasn't pressed any buttons. If it's minus one, that is if the user has pressed to the left. And that means either the A key, if you're using VAST, the left arrow key, or using a controller that he points to the left. And it's going to be one if he points to the right. So if he presses D, right arrow, or a controller where he points to the right. So this here is a value that represents in which direction our player wants to move. So all we need to do is now store this in some variable, and then we can use it to add forces or move that player. So let's store it in a private float variable, and let's call this one movement. And we can set it equal to zero by default. Then in here, we simply set movement equal to input.getAccess raw. But again, this is going to be always between minus one and one. So if we want to control the speed at which our player moves, we're going to have to multiply that with our speed value. So now if we uh, multiply this and uh, the user wants to go to the left, it's going to be minus four. If he wants to go to the right, it's going to be four because our speed value is four and one times four is four. Cool. Then in the separate loop here, and this is uh, why Okay, so we need to write fixed update here. And the reason why we're not doing the actual movement inside of the update, I mean, the logic is fine. Every frame we want to move a little bit. So let's just move the player inside of the update is that Unity's physics system really likes if movement is done in fixed update because the physics system itself uses that to do all of its calculations. So that's why we gather all of our input inside of the update so that it feels really responsive. And then we do the actual movement, the actual moving of our character inside of the fixed update because that's where Unity wants to calculate physics. So in here, uh, we're going to say something like rb, which is our rigid body, dot move position. And this is a function again that moves the rigid body to a certain position. And the position is given by two values, which means a vector two that has an X axis and a Y axis, an X position and a Y position. So the two values that we wanna give aren't just zero and two. We want to give our current position plus our movement. So in that case, what we'll do um, is kind of, there's several ways that you can do this actually. I just want to go rb.position and then we can add onto that our um, vector two dot right multiplied with movement. So basically what we're doing here, and this is the exact same as actually, I should maybe be a bit more clear here. This is the exact same thing as saying rb.position plus vector two. And then as the first coordinate, we specify movement and then zero. So what we're saying is we want to move to a new position and the position that we want to move to is our current position plus a bit of movement on the X and no movement on the Y. So that's currently what we're doing. And um, if you think this is a bit confusing, that's because this is about vectors and uh, vectors are a whole mathematical concept that you kind of had to have to get in order to fully understand what's going on here. So if you want to learn more about that, I actually have a video uh, in the game math theory course on vectors. I believe it was the first video actually. So if you just go to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash brackies, you can go in there, find the video game math theory forces and uh, learn a lot more about how this actually works. But for now, you can just copy after me. 
And the final thing that we need to do is actually not use movement, but multiply it with time dot fixed delta time as well. And that's because this um, fixed update here runs at a fixed interval. And we just multiply with that interval in order to um, have it be consistent on different systems. So no matter the rate that this uh, up function runs at, we're going to have the same amount of movement. So it's just something that you're going to have to do. And you do that all the time if you want to do movement over time. Awesome. I believe that was pretty much all we needed to do for movement. So now we should be able to go into Unity here and we should be able to uh, hit play. And let's just move to the left here. You can see that works and to the right. That's awesome. And I can both use A and D and left and uh, right on the uh, arrow keys. And when we hit a wall, you can see we bump into it and it doesn't work. So we do actually have collision here, but it's in a very controlled uh, way. And you can see just how snappy the movement is. I think that feels really, really good. Cool. So that was play and movement. And I'm going to take a sip of water here. And I'm also just going to have a look in uh, the chat, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, yeah, someone says if um, we want this to be smooth instead of really, really snappy movement, we can go in here and, and remove the raw part. So just get axis will um, also give you a value between minus one and one, but it will smooth it out so that when you press a key, you can see that it slowly starts and um, interpolates as it's called uh, to the desired direction. That's also uh, super nice for a lot of games, but I am an old school guy and I like the raw motion. Uh, so we're just going to do that uh, for this game at least. But you, again, you're totally fine just changing that and then continuing with the uh, tutorial. Um, so yeah, cool. So the next thing that we want to look at is having some bouncy balls in here. So let's go ahead and create those. So again, I'm going to be using a very, very simple sprite that I just created in Photoshop. I basically just took the circle tool, created a circle, exported it, and that's it. And if we um, go out to my desktop here, you can see that I've prepared it here. It's just a circle. Don't mind that it's in Photoshop format. It could be uh, PNG as well. Just make sure that it has transparency. And um, all we want to do here is maybe change the pixels per unit to something higher just to make it a bit smaller. And I also want to change the max size to 64. I believe I exported at a 128 and that's just too high. We don't need it. So let's now drag this inside of our game and we can see that that already looks uh, really good in terms of size for kind of a medium sized ball. So we'll call this one ball and we'll go in here and um, maybe play around with this a bit. So I want the color of this ball to be a uh, yellow. This variation can be, uh, can be yellow. I think it's going to look good inside the game. Yeah, that looks just fine. And, um, we want to of course add some properties to this. So the first thing is a collider. And I think we want to use a circle collider 2d. And if we focus on it, you can see that the radius fits exactly the way that it should. But I do actually want to de decrease this a tiny bit again. Again, I think it just produces better results. So let's just try that. And if it looks like it's clipping through the ground, um, of course, we'll just bump that back up. So um, now that we have our circle collider, we also want a rigid body component. Again, rigid body 2D, of course. And uh, all we really need to do here is nothing. I believe this should work just fine, at least. For now, I'll show you a glitch with this. So if we just go ahead and hit the pl uh, hit play now, you can see that it's already working. However, it's not really bouncing anywhere. So what we need to do is add bounciness to the ball. And we do that by adding a physics material that defines how um, the collider and the rigid body acts in physics space that has two properties. Um, it has bounciness and friction. So let's go ahead and create that, create a new, physics material 2d let's just call this one ball we'll select the ball and drag in our new physics 2d material there we go and that sits under the collider not under the uh, rigid body actually you can do it under the rigid body as well i didn't know that i believe that's a new thing doesn't really matter this works fine and then we can select the ball we can bump down the friction to zero we don't want any kind of forces acting there and then we can bump the bounciness all the way up to one. So now we can just hit play and we should see that the ball jumps. So that's awesome. 
One problem with this is that I tested it and I just left it there jumping around and actually it was increasing in height. And you might be able to see this on stream or it might not be happening because we are not applying forces. Actually, it looks like it is. And for some reason, when our bounciness is one, it should bounce to the exact same height. You can see this actually jumping higher and higher and the moment it's going to hit the ceiling. We have the bounciness at one. Why is it gaining momentum? That shouldn't be possible for this ball to jump higher and higher. We're defying all laws of physics right now and just creating new force out of nothing. But yeah, it's really interesting behavior. And the reason for this really is that if we just go ahead and pause it, we might be able to see it happen even. Go frame by frame. You can see just how far the ball actually goes into the ground. I mean, it's not because of the collider adjustment that I made. You can see it goes way below the wall. And it's actually going into the wall and it's bouncing a bit there and it's creating this negative force that shoots it right back. And that allows it to gain momentum. So in order to fix that, what we need to do is select our ball and change the collision detection from discrete to continuous. And this just means that when it's going to collide against other uh, static colliders or things that don't move, which are, our walls do not, it's going to do it in a much more precise way. And I could, of course, leave this running for a long time to show you that it won't do it again. But just trust me, the dynamic collision actually works. Or at least I haven't had any problems with it whatsoever. It's something that not a lot uh, of people know, but it's a really, really handy trick. So what we need to do now is add some start force to our ball in order to actually make it kind of move across our level because it's not really uh, that exciting that it's just bouncing up and down in one place. So to do this, let's go ahead and create a new script and we'll call this one the ball C sharp script and we'll double click it to open it up in Visual Studio. And um, we can delete all of the system.collection things and uh, let's go ahead and create a new variable and this is going to be a public vector two. And this is going to be our start force. So basically what this allows us to do is now inside of Unity, and this is one of the really um, nicer things that Unity does, is allowing us to edit vector twos and vector three, threes inside of our scripts, inside of the inspector. So in here we can now say that we want this to start with a force of positive two on the X and zero on the Y. And then, of course, we need to also script this. So uh, that means that we want to apply this force inside of the start method. So when we start, we want to do, um, of course, when we're applying a force, we need a reference to our rigid body. And again, we can just do that by creating a public rigid body to the RB, saving that, going into Unity here and dragging in the appropriate rigid body. And that should work fine. There we go. Whoops back into Visual Studio. And now we just go rb.addForce and the force that we want to add is our start force, which currently is two on the X and zero on the Y. And when it comes to forces, it can be a bit confusing as to how do, big does the force need to be uh, in order to gain uh, this much um, um, movement and stuff like that, because it's not really using any units. We don't have any units on this. It's not using, using newtons or anything like that, uh, but really just play around with it. One thing that I will say is we need to go in here and specify the force mode 2D to be force mode 2D, to be imp uh, not force, but impulse. And this uh, basically means that it uh, the values will need to be much, much smaller um, in order to actually move the ball. You use impulse for one time force adds, such as in the start method, say uh, in an explosion, stuff like that, you want to use the impulse mode and you use force if you want to use a continuous force application, such as for a thruster on a plane or stuff like that. So we can save that now and we should see that when we just head in here, hit play, the ball should actually be yeah it's it just shoots over and it keeps going until something stops it such as our player and you can see that it can even interact with our player without any issue so i'm just going to move this over here so we won't get hit by it right away but it's going to do a bit of bouncing first but it is coming to get us cool so um 
that was kind of the um, basic functionality for our ball. Next up, we need to do something in order to be able to shoot out some uh, kind of grappling hook or a harpoon, uh, that chain that you saw me shoot uh, straight up in the air uh, earlier when I was demonstrating the game. And uh, before we go ahead and do that, I'm just again going to have a quick look in the chat to see how everyone is doing. Are you fine? Um, everything looks good. Um, let's see here. Everything looks good. Cool. Yeah, so let's just continue. So um, what we need to do is, of course, create some graphics for this. So let's start by creating a new... Uh, empty game object again control shift n and let's call this one uh, chain and i want this to be the parent object just sit in the middle at the moment and for this chain we can drag in a square which is going to be the graphics of our chain and i want the scale heat here to be something like 0.3 on the x i think it's it should just be really really thin and basically what i wanted to do was move our chain here down to kind of the same level as our player. So just let's imagine that it's sitting on top, just on top of our ground here, and let's move it over. And basically why I've nested these objects is so that we can have the chain, uh, we can give the chain a pivot point down here, and then we can have the square here move that up and extend all the way up. And you can see the chain still has a pivot down here. So make sure you're viewing that in pivot and not center. And that just allows us to now, if we uh, say scale this um, up a bit here, so just scale it up here, to simply change the Y scale of our chain in order to edit that graphic. And if we then go onto our square here and even add a box collider 2D, uh, that should automatically snap onto it here. That's going to scale with it. And that might be hard to see in the video, uh, on, on the stream, but I can actually see that we have the screen wrap around. So that's awesome. So now we can take our square here and basically I want, when this has a Y value of one, I would like this to be, uh, go from the bottom of our screen to the top, just to kind of give ourselves an impression of what, uh, how um, the sizes our values need to be in order to reach the top of our level. So I'm just going to uh, drag this up here and you need to be careful when doing this that you don't mess, whoops, mess things up. I was just saying it here. And of course, this doesn't need to be perfect uh, because the way that we're going to be uh, checking if our wave should be pulled back is not by saying if our chain is at one, but instead by checking for collision um, collisions with either the uh, balls or uh, the top wall here, the ceiling. Cool, so this is going to be our, uh, I don't know, we can do this chain, uh, what do we need to call this chain graphics, but it also has a collider, so that's not really fitting. Let's just call this one chain pivot, and then we can just call that one chain, I think that's actually best. <sighs> I don't like it. Let's call this one chain, and let's call this one chain graphics. There we go. That's how we're going to do it. And yes, it has a collider, so it's not only graphics, and it's also going to have a script, but quite down people. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> awesome. So um, what we can do now is of course, add a script onto this chain in order to actually make it interactable inside the game. So let's go ahead and add a new C sharp component. Um, and let's call it chain. Let's keep it symbol. And we can double click this to open it up in Visual Studio as well. And uh, what I want to do is um, start by creating a public static boolean called is fired or is firing, is um, doing something, whatever, is active. Something to indicate whether or not we fired our chain or if it's waiting to be fired. And we want to default that to false. And because this is a static boolean, meaning that it can be accessed from all other places without needing a reference to the instance of the class, but only the type. That's a very technical explanation. I'm going to show you what that means in a second, but because it's marked as static, it's going to uh, move or keep its value 
when we change scene. So when we reload our level, and if this is true, it's also going to be true in the next one. So what we need to do is inside of our start set is fired to false to force it to be false even though we've changed levels. And uh, we can therefore remove that one up there, that's unnecessary. So in our start, we're just always going to set it to false. Cool. Then in our update, we can say that if the chain is fired, well, then we want to do one thing. And if it's not, then we want to do another thing. And let's have a look at what we want to do in these two cases. So if it's fired, we want it to stay still and slowly animate upwards, which means that we want to animate our wire scale. And if it um, is, uh, if it isn't fired, we want it to just snap to the position and follow the position of our character. So let's start by doing exactly that. So um, in order to follow around our player, we'll need a reference to our player, and that means we need a public transform. And let's just call this one player. Then inside of our update, if we aren't firing or if it isn't fired, we can go here and say player, or we could say um, our current position. So transform dot position equals player dot position. And because we've gone in and solved all of the problems with our pivot points, because the chain here has a pivot at the very bottom, and because our player also, because we went in and created a separate object, has a pivot on at the bottom center, we can just say transform.position equals player.position, and we don't need to differentiate between all of the coordinates. We can just have all of the coordinates be the same, and that just makes everything so much easier. Awesome. So when we aren't firing, we just want it to snap to the position of our player. And let's just see if that works. So I'm just going to leave it at uh, 1, the chain here, and that's fine. And we can drag in our player. And we can hit play and it should snap over. Awesome. So I don't know what's going on with our player here. Okay, so the reason why our player just went crazy there, I want I'm not holding down anything, and you can see it still just goes crazy, is the uh, is because we currently have a collision between our chain and our player. And we don't want that. And in general, this game depends a lot on collision. So we are going to take a look at, at the collision matrix dun 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 and i believe that's worth taking a sip of water for yeah so basically the collision matrix is a way to control what layers and you can assign layers to an object by simply going up here and selecting a layer and you can add new ones what layers which meaning what groups of objects can collide with other layers and the thing uh, that this is really handy for is that you can do stuff like disable internal collisions. So if you have a lot of balls, which are all in the layer ball, well, then you can disable balls collision uh, with other balls. And that means that they can just move around freely without any weird behavior. The same way we can go in here and assign a layer to our player. We can also, let's just create one for our chain and create one for the wall. And let's create one for ball. And we can go into a player, assign the player, go into our chain, assign the chain. And yes, we do, do want to change the children. Not that it really matters. Um, actually, here it does because our children is the one with the collider. So that's really important. And um, in our ball, we'll change that to ball. And our walls here, I want to change all of them except the bottom one. And the reason for that uh, to wall. So we'll just go in there, change all of them to wall. Um, actually, I want to go into this one and then change this one back to default. I think that's cleaner. Cool. So the reason why I don't want to change the bottom one to wall is because I want to enable collisions <coughs> between the player and the walls. Um, but actually, what was my reasoning? I think I've, I, 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 no, we know to, uh, why to do this, but I can't really figure out why yet. Okay, so we'll just leave that at default for now and we'll find out why it was that I knew that we should do that at a later point. <laughs> this is the good thing about doing things over and over is that uh, at some point you just do them and you don't really know why, but you don't really care. So it just works, okay? <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do now is go under Edit, Project Settings, and then Physics 2D. And I reveal to you the layer collision matrix. And it looks scary, 
really scary and it is <laughs> because you always are going to mess this up if you're anything like me um, but it's it's just so handy so the first thing here is you can see we have a ball here and we also have a ball here so this is our ball with ball collision and we're going to disable that because we don't want those to bump each into each other we also have our wall with wall collision we don't want our walls to collide we want our ball to collide with walls that's totally fine we don't want our chain um we want our chain to collide with balls that's totally fine as well we uh, want our chain to collide with walls and this is why this is why that i uh, i don't did not mark the bottom wall um as a wall and that's because we don't want our chain to collide with that part we don't want that because that would mean that it would sometimes trigger as soon as it's sent out and that would mean that it would re return even though we don't see it and things would look super weird so we don't want our chain uh to collide with that particular wall but all other walls um, but we do want it to yeah, collide with uh, uh, objects tagged as or in the wall layer. And we don't want the chain to collide with itself. We don't want the player to collide with the chain. And we don't want the player to collide with the player. So you can just go through here and do all kinds of things. We don't want our ball to collide with default ob Yes, we do. Uh, we don't want our wall to collide with default objects. We don't want our chain to collide with default objects, but we do want our player to do that. So this is how your um, layer collision matrix should be set up. It's super confusing and you can see why it's so easy to mess this up, uh, but really it's also really, really easy to change. And this is just an awesome part of Unity. I really like this because it allows you to do so much with physics without needing to code all of this functionality in and change it in the code if you just change around some layers. You can just go in here, have a visual representation of what's going on, even though it might be a bit confusing. And uh, yeah, it's just really, really nice. So um, we should be able to now hit play and not explode and we uh, we we are able to do that and you can see I can hit the ball here with uh, um, <laughs> with our chain and one thing I want to do is go under our chain and change this to a trigger I don't think there's any reason why this should be applying forces or anything like that we just want this to be uh, to notice whenever it's hit so that we can reset and do stuff like that uh, cool so that was the initial part of our chain. That was um, what is going to happen when we aren't firing. And one thing that we want to do here as well is just set our local scale on the Y equal to zero. So we can say transform.localScale equals a new vector three um, with one, zero, and one. So one on the X, zero on the Y, and one on the Z. And this is also a handy part um, when nesting these is that we can set this x to 1 and still remain the, f uh, the fact that we have uh, 0.3 on the x of the graphics. Good. Uh, so that should mean that when we now play, this downsizes and we can't actually see it. You can see here that it is down here, but it's so tiny that we cannot see it. It's scaled to 0. Isn't it? Y scale Y55. Oh, it's this one. Cool. Yeah, I'm confusing myself already. So what we can do now is go under our um, Visual Studio and we can have a look at what's going to happen when we do actually fire. But first, let's actually create some user input that allows us to do that. So let's go in here, create an if statement, say if input dot input dot get bottom down. And if we get a button called fire one, then we want to um, say is fired equals true. And that's all. We still want to pass through to handle all of the rest. And um, the cooler thing, cool thing about this input that get button fire one is that it allows us currently to use on uh, the mouse for clicking. But we can go in here and go edit project settings and then input. We can find the fire one and we can add alternative buttons on here as well. You can see it has a positive button here called mouse zero, which is our left click. Uh, and you can also do it using left control. I wanna change that to space. So now when we go in here, we should be able to, and you can't really see this, click and use space, but again, not visible. So let's actually go in and make this visible. So if we are firing, what we wanna do is 
um, add a bit onto the Y scale of our object each frame. So we just want to slowly increase this number. And the way that we do that is by going transform dot local scale is equal to our current transform dot local scale and then plus vector three dot up multiplied with time dot um, delta time dot fixed dot, dot delta time here. Yeah, cool. So basically what we're saying here is that we want to have the same one uh, or, or the same X coordinate as we've already uh, always had. We want to have the same Y coordinate, but or Z uh, coordinate, but our Y coordinate should slowly increase. And the rate at which it should do that is uh, from zero to one at one second. So one unit a second. And if you want to speed this up, what we could do is add a speed up here, public float um, speed for the chain and set that equal to say two. And that means now that when we go down here and multiply that in, so multiply with speed, we uh, will now shoot a lot faster. So let me just show you that this is actually working. So we can go in here, we should be able to hit play. And when I now click, you can see that our chain goes up. We can set the speed to one instead and we should see it go half the speed. And it does. And we can of course also go below one here if you want some really slow chain. Awesome, so that's working. And also you can see that we can move away from the chain once it's fired. So that's a really important part of the script. You will also notice that the chain doesn't reset when it hits the ceiling, it just keeps going, or whenever a ball bounces into it, simply nothing happens. And that's because, of course, we marked it as trigger, but also we haven't implemented any code for actually resetting this is fired variable. That's just going to remain true. So what we go uh, and do now is add a bit of collision detection or trigger detection on our chain graphics object, and then we simply reset that variable. So that's the next part of this whole thing. And we are getting closer to actually having a game here. The next thing that we're going to be doing after that is actually splitting the balls in two and spawning that. And that's actually the most uh, fun part, if you ask me. So don't worry, we're getting to it just in a moment. So again, water and... Um, you guys are being awesome in chat. Really awesome to see so many people in here. Um, and people are still talking about uh, Ludum Dare. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I think we're just going to go ahead and continue. Cool. So uh, yeah, the next part is, of course, uh, registering when some object enters this uh, tra chain trigger. And to do that, let's add a new component. Let's call this something like chain collision or chain trigger chain event. Ah, we can do a lot of stuff this, with this. Let's just call it chain collision. Let's double click it again to open it up in Visual Studio. And uh, now we can go in here and we can have just a single function here. The function that we want, and we can delete these as well. There we go. The function that we want is a void on trigger enter 2d there we go and you need to write this out the exact same way that i've done it here no improvising on capital letters or anything like that because this is a unity callback just like start awake update fixed update this is called by unity when unity decide unity decides to do so in our case this function is going to call whenever a um collider so that means our ball for example or uh, our walls hit the trigger collider on our chain. Then this method is going to call, but only once, only when it's actually hit, when another collider enters the trigger. So this basically allows us to uh, just throw out a debug the lock statement when this happens. So something hit the chain. There you go, and this should actually work right away. Um, we don't do any checking on what uh, what hit it, but you can see right off the bat it says something hit the chain, and I'm not totally sure what hit the chain but something did and we can we can go ahead and hit um and fire it here and you can see when it hits the wall it says something hit the chain it should also do so when our um yeah it does so when our ball does it as well so you can see that that is working and it shouldn't be a problem that something hits it uh in the very beginning 
I don't quite know what it is that it's colliding with because it shouldn't be able to... Oh, it might be the top here before we reset the position. So that could be it. If we just go in here and set the uh, Y scale to zero, just to test this <coughs> just to test this out, you can see that disappears. So that's why it, it triggered right off the bat. So what we can do now is go in here and every time something hits this trigger, um, we're simply going to reset our chain. And we don't need to check if it was a ball or a wall because that's the only things that our chain uh, is able to collide with because of our physics uh, trigger, our physics layer, physics collision matrix thing. Cool. So what we can do is simply say chain dot is fired equals false. And that's it. And that's the awesome part about using a static boolean is because we only have one player in here, one chain, we can use the static one to control this instance here without any issues. I mean, if, if we had multiple people, we couldn't do it this way because um, that would reset the chain for all of the players, but it just allows us to say chain that is fired and we don't need to reference this particular object. So that's really cool. And also I actually want to change the I here to a capital I, not a, not a capital S. <laughs> And uh, just to make things uh, make it clear that this is a static variable, that's a naming convention that I like to use. And the way that I quickly rename everything here, and it's also going to rename in the other script, is by using Control R, Control R. So you need to do that twice, and that forces uh, Unity, forces Visual, Visual Studio to do refactoring. So you can also right click. I believe you can go something like rename here. You can see there it's called refactoring. Awesome. So that should actually reset our chain. And when we go in and hit play now, um, we should see that working. So if I just, uh, let's try hitting the wall. Awesome, resets it. And the same thing when we hit a ball. Of course, nothing is currently happening to our ball. So um, before we make that happen, I'm just gonna go in here and change the color of um, this chain here. I don't think it's too pretty. Just want to tint it the same color actually as, um, our border. I think that looks good. So I just used the color picker to do that. And uh, I'm pretty pleased with that. So we can change that back to zero. And uh, yeah, good. So the next thing is, of course, we need to check if what we've hit is actually a ball because we are both colliding with uh, walls and balls. And so we need to check if it's the one it's if it's one or the other. And the way to do this is we gather information about what we hit by creating a variable up here, collider2d, and we're just going to call this uh, call for collider. And what we can then do is say, no matter what we want to set chain that is fired to false, but we can then check if call dot say tag is equal to ball or wall, in which case we want to uh, do some stuff um, with the ball, we want to split it. So debug.log split ball in two. There we go. And all we need to do in order to trigger this is now go into our ball object and change the tag here to a new one that we're going to be making called, you guessed it, ball. Cool. So we'll just tag that as ball. We can also drag this down to make a prefab out of it. That's going to be, yeah, that's just good practice. And now we should see that when we hit play, when we hit our uh, roof here, nothing happens. When we hit our ball, it says split ball in two. And that is the next thing that we will be doing. So let me just see. Everything is going uh, well. Uh, a lot of discussion about Visual Studio and Mono Develop. I mean, it's really about what you're comfortable with. But um, I will say if you're on Windows and have free access to Visual Studios, I don't see a lot of reasons to use Mono Develop. Maybe the simplicity. And that's, of course, a good reason if you're starting out but Visual Studio just has so many nice features. It's so ex uh, extendable and um, it's just really solid. Mono Develop has a lot of issues in terms of crashing and stuff like that. But then to be fair, I haven't been using Mono Develop for a year now, so I don't really know what the current state of the software is. But yeah, just wanted to comment on that. Cool. So um, yeah, the next thing is splitting the ball in two. And what we want to do here is create a script. Actually, we already have a script, um, but we want to modify our ball script a bit. What I want to do is create a public function, a public void, which means that we will be able to call it from in within our chain collision script. Whenever this happens, we'll be able to grab the ball and call 
the function this function on it and it's going to be called something like split and um, what we need to do here is of course destroy the current object so we want to destroy our ball and uh, we do that by simply calling destroy and then giving it game object with the non capital G which refers to this game object that the script is sitting on which is our ball uh, but we of course we don't want to do this first because then the rest of the code won't be called so we want to do some stuff and then destroy the ball and what we want to do is instantiate some new ones in case there are any more uh, to instantiate at least. So let's create up here a public game object and this is going to be a reference to the next ball prefab. So let's just call that next ball and that allows us now to go in here and you can see there's an empty slot where we can drag in the prefab of the next ball that we want to spawn. We can even drag in our own prefab which means that each time this ball gets hit, it's just going to spawn two copies of itself. And that's already pretty fun. So let's just actually try that. Now, it's going to be an infinite game, but and hit apply on the prefab, and that's an important part. It's going to be an infinite game, but it's going to be fun. So what we can do then is, um, if our next ball is not equal to null, so if we've actually dragged something in there, if we haven't, that means that it's the last ball, or we forgot, but... Uh, it should be mean uh, that it's the last ball and therefore we simply want to destroy it so that we can continue on to the next level. Uh, but if we have something in there, we want to instantiate next ball and we want to instantiate it at our current position, which means rb.position. And the reason why I'm using rb.position and not transform.position here is because rb.position gives us our position in x and y and ignores the z component, so as a vector 2. But transform.position always gives a vector 3, which is annoying. So we'll just use rb.position. And then um, we can use quaternion.identity because we don't want any rotation on this. And uh, we can go ahead and duplicate uh, this entire thing. And um, I want them to be spawned at slightly different positions. I don't want them to be spawned totally on top of each other. You can do that and it's going to look fine. But I think in the original games that they offset them a bit so that they start a bit to the right and a bit to the left. And to do that, we simply add on to here vector 2 dot right. And then we can maybe divide by, say, 4 so that we don't uh, offset them by a full unit by only a fourth of a unit. And we can uh, do the same thing here, so plus vector 3 and then dot left divided by 4. So just offsetting them a tiny, tiny bit. And this should already work. Um, if we go in here and hit play, we should see that when we hit this ball, it destroys itself. Whoops, of course we also need to call the method. So now we need to go into our chain collision and we need to go in here and use the fact that we have a reference to the collider. So our ball is currently called call. And then we need to get the um, ball script on that object. So this here, this ball object is called call here. It's the collider. And we need to get this particular script so we can call a function in that script. And we do that by going call.getComponent of type ball. And then we do dot in order to access all of the things on, in that ball script. And we then uh, go um, split. The, the split method and we call that particular method. So again, when something enters our chain, we're going to collect a bit of information about what entered it. We're going to say that we're no longer firing. We're going to check if the thing that enters um, had a tag of ball. And if it does, we're going to get the ball script off or component off that object and call the split method on that, which is going to go in here or not in here um, and actually check if we have another ball to spawn. If we do, it's going to spawn two and destroy the current one. Cool. So now we should be able to hit, um, play here and things should work. So let's see, there you can see it instantiates two new balls, but you can see our forces here are acting really weird. I mean, they're going all over the place and we do not want that. What we want instead is, of course, reset our start force down here. We want that to be zero. And then on this particular ball here that we placed in the level, we want that to be two. So from now on, we want all of the balls in the project to have zero. And then we can change them for the individual instances, but without hitting apply. Then uh, what we can do is control the start force 
of the balls that spawn inside the script. And we do that by first getting a reference to the objects that we've instantiated themselves, so the whole entire game objects. And we do that by first saying game object and then creating kind of a temporary variable to store it in. And this is going to be ball uh, one. Actually, I'm just going to do one like that. And we are going to set that equal to what we just instantiated, what we just spawned. We're going to create a second one here called ball two and set that equal to the second ball that we just spawned. What we can then do is use get component on both of these. So ball one dot get component of type ball, just in the same way that we did our chain collision here. We want to do get component ball. And um, what we can then do is set the start force on these balls. So we can set start force here equal to a new vector two. And the first coordinate needs to be something like two. It's going to be fine. And I also want to give them a bit of force on the y-axis. And this allows them to kind of get that nice bouncing tra um, tra trajectory, whatever, how you say that, um, where they kind of bounce upwards and over. So they apply a bit of upwards momentum each time we split them in half. And that just gives a bit of liveliness to the game. And I want to set that to something like five on the y. So we can now duplicate this entire thing and we can change the, uh, this to be bold two. And here we want to apply negative two on the X so that this will go in the opposite direction. And uh, that should actually work. So I believe that's pretty much all of the core functionality that we need in here. Now it's just a matter of setting it up in Unity and maybe also adding an in condition. So if we hit play here, we should see that when we hit the ball, Awesome, it splits in two and it's just going to keep doing this infinitely. So this is another example of how you can take this same concept and these same mechanics to create a fun little mini game, kind of a spin off to the original series. And you can see that I currently cannot die. So this is just happy times where we can keep doing this until the computer gets really tired and maybe crashes. But it is definitely fun, so we won't worry about that. And you can see here how important it is that we used our layer collision matrix to make the balls not collide with each other. But yeah, that was uh, kind of the base of what we need um, to do. So before we continue on and actually make this into a playable game, let me just have again a quick look in the uh, in the chat here. Um, Let's see, no need to get component because I'm already in the ball script. That's not totally true because uh, this ball script here refers to the ball that is currently being split in half. And that's a separate object from the two balls that we want to create. So what we do is actually uh, spawn two balls from this, uh, this ball, from the current ball being split in half. And then we have references to each individual ball and we get their individual versions of the ball script and change their start force. Not the start force for all of them, but their particular start force. And that's why we need to use get component. And that's kind of the base of understanding the difference between a type, which is our class up here, which is our ball type. And the fact that we can have multiple balls in there, different instances of that type. So yeah, I can see why you get confused because the naming is the same, but now we are not talking about a type, we are talking about a particular instance, a particular creation, a particular ball. Um, so yeah, that's the difference there. Really good question though. All right, so um, where to go from here? I think uh, we need to link up all of the balls and then we need to do an, uh, a game over condition. So the first thing is, is really, really easy and it's really something that you should just go nuts with in terms of imagination and just um, figuring out exactly one, what you want to do. I'm just going to create a ball. Let's make this ball four uh, and I'm going to do ball zero four here and uh, we can duplicate this inside of the inspector here and we can um, so this is ball five and you can see how unity automatically names it, it, it names it. It's totally awesome. Um, and we can take our ball four and drag it into the next ball of our ball five. And that means that when our ball five splits in half, it's going to split into ball four and yeah, you get the drill and we can change the color of this ball. And actually let's just get it inside the inspector so we can see what's going on. 
So this is ball five. We can change the color of this to something uh, red to indicate that this is really large and dangerous. And let's also bump up the size to say uh, 1.5. And uh, that looks just, just fine actually. Uh, the ball four is fine. We can duplicate that and we can rename this one to ball three because we want them to get increasingly smaller now. And uh, we can make this one uh, say blue. I believe I made it blue in the video. So let's do the same thing here. And we can uh, bump down the scale to say 0.6 on all the axes and that's going to look fine and notice how the collider follows our scaling so that's really really nice we don't have to worry about scaling that um separately and i changed that inside of the uh game itself i want to change it in here instead so 0.6 on all the axes there we go but really we could just hit apply makes no difference awesome and we want to not drag in ball three here we want to have our ball four reference the ball three and we want to have our ball three reference ball two which we're going to be creating now so let's uh, create a new ball here ball uh, two and we can just keep going with this to create as many stages of these balls that we want to so i'm just going to have ball two in here and um this one again let's drag it into the scene this one i would like to be uh, green so let's make it green here and uh, we're going to make it even smaller, something like 0.3, I think is good. That might be too small because we want one to be even smaller than this. So maybe 0.45 is going to be good. And we can make that green, that's cool. And we want to reference that under the ball three, of course, something like that. Again, I'm creating one more level than, or level, uh, one more ball type than uh, what I did uh, for the video. But I just thought that I would show you how easy this is to do. We can create ball one now as well. I'll drag that inside the inspector, have this be uh, some other, maybe even just gray. Could be fine because it needs to be so small, but still it's really dangerous when they, they're this small because it, they are really hard to hit. But we can make this say 0.2 on all the axes. I think that's kind of fun to have a really small little devil in there. Um, and I actually want them to maybe be, yeah, let's just make it gray. And uh, we need to reference that in ball two. So ball two references ball one. And ball one doesn't reference anything. So that will actually pop um, and that should work just fine. So you can see how that is set up. Hit apply on that. Um, we apply this. We apply that. The ball four here, we don't want to apply the start force. We want that to be zero. Apply that. We delete all of them except for the biggest one, which is our ball five move that somewhere over here for example and now we should see that this is working so let's hit play and try the game out so okay so we need a start force on that so ball five here we can set two on the x for the start force and we should be able to see them splitting and that's awesome so you can see how that looks and again when we kill off the gray ones uh, they are indeed going to disappear so this is actually quite difficult Luckily, I'm not able to die yet. We haven't implemented that yet, but it's still woo, not totally easy. But I feel that this is already a pretty nice spin-off game and it's actually a lot more fast-paced and action-packed because um, everything moves a lot quicker and the player does as well. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. So the last thing that I wanted to do was just implement the, um, the game over. And in order to do this, we just have to look, uh, uh, we just have to have a look at our player. We can double click on our player. We can create a new on trigger. Actually, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be an on collider enter because this is a collider. So on collider uh, enter 2D. Again, this is not a trigger. So we have a collision, not a, not a trigger enter. And um, we don't want to use collider 2D because we actually get more information we get collision 2d and this is the same as collider 2d but instead of just having a reference to what we collided with we also get some information about how the collision uh went so the force at which they collided and the point at which they hit and stuff like that so we simply get some physics information that you don't get when using a trigger um and whoops what we do i turned on insert there we go <laughs> so what we do here is simply go uh, call as well and then we say if uh, call 
dot tag dot collider dot tag is equal to a ball. Well, then we want to restart. So we can just throw a debug.log here saying game. Let's do a more dramatic one game over. And in order to restart our current level, we simply go into Unity. Uh, we import Unity Engine. Unity Engine dot sort dot scene management. There we go. And down here, we simply go scene manager dot load scene. And the scene that we want to load is the currently active scene. So we go scene manager dot get active scene. And then we need to do either dot name or dot build index because we can't feed the actual scene. We need to feed it either a build index or a name. That's the exact same thing. And that should actually be it. I believe that's all um, we needed to do. On col not on collider enter. It needs to be on collision enter like that. Yes, good. That wouldn't have worked. Thank you to the chat for the people to SkyText for just saying that. Uh, I would totally have been stuck at that on that for <laughs> a long time. It's the worst. So um, yeah, we should see now that when we get hit by a ball, it's a game over and it just quits the game. And you can easily add a slow motion effect or something cool in here uh, to make the game over look better. You can add some UI and then delay so that it doesn't just restart immediately. Check out the Dodge the Blocks uh, tutorial. It's on the YouTube channel that was also recorded live, live stream. Again, Dodge the Blocks if you want to see that kind of um, uh, bullet time slow-mo uh, when uh, you get hit by something and, and then it restarts. So I think that was all. One thing that I just noticed is that our chain is in front of our player, but all we need to do here is simply change the order and layer to something smaller than our player. So we could just do minus two there, and that is now fixed. So that's the entire game, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I really don't have anything more to add. I'm just going to attempt a playthrough here now that we are finally done with the game. And then we can go ahead and do some Q&A. So prepare your questions. Actually, just spam them in the chat already. And we can kind of transition to that part. I really hope that you enjoyed this. Again, if you missed out on something, if there's something that you find difficult, um, right after the stream, this is going to be available in the um, Twitch archive. I'm also going to upload it to YouTube as soon as possible. And um, I'm also going to be uploading the project to GitHub at uh, the same time that I upload to YouTube. So you can get your hands on all of the code, all of the really super high advanced graphics and um, uh, the full Unity project. So I'm just going to hit play here and let's have a playthrough and let's see how this goes. So I'm just going to attempt, attempt to beat the game. And it's not going to happen. I can promise you that. I think we need to start with some of the smaller ones instead of splitting up some of the others uh, immediately. Or else we're just going to have a lot of things flying around. This is actually going a lot better than I expected. And I know that right after saying that... Oh, I shouldn't have done that. No, 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 no. This is where the decision making crumbles. Uh, it's actually going... Whoa! Jesus. All right. So these live gameplays are also always really scary. I cannot believe people. Who yeah, I messed it up. I'm sorry. We didn't get to the end of the game. Ah, oh. <laughs> I will never ever do a separate gaming channel. Don't worry. Uh, it's just embarrassing. Cool. So let's change to some uh, questions and answers. And for this part, I'm going to change over to the chat Twitch layout so you can see the chat on YouTube as well. And uh, yeah, give me some questions. So um, why don't I use autocomplete? I do use autocomplete. Uh, I don't know if it's just turned off on Visual Studio right now. Sometimes it bugs out. No, no, it's here. I use that all the time. Uh, sometimes I just write it out if I'm too lazy to actually select it on the list. But I do that uh, a lot. Um, is it easy to get the line uh, to go to the mouse position? So um, do you mean that the line should just follow around the mouse? You can definitely do that quite easily. You just need to use input.get mouse position. And then you can do some things on the camera uh, to turn that into a from a screen 
coordinate thing into a world position thing. And there's a lot of stuff on that on uh, both the Brackis Forum, the Unity Forum. Um, there's a lot of tutorials on that. It should be relatively uh, simple. Um, I will not stream at Ludum Dare. Uh, unfortunately, I will be participating, but I cannot really say how much I'm, uh, time I'm able to dedicate yet. And so setting up streams and all of that, it's both really time consuming and frankly quite taxing, especially if you need to uh, uh, to stream for so long. So I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be streaming it uh, this time. I am, however, going to be recording my progress on the game. And unless it turns out really, really bad, I'm going to make a post-mortem uh, video the same way that I did digging, where it's kind of behind the scenes and I show the creation of it. That was just really, really fun. I think it's one of the best videos uh, on the channel, if I if I may say so myself. I think it's uh, it's just a lot of fun because it combines a lot of subjects and, and shows kind of the full process of game development, at least the fun process. <laughs> cool. So, um, um, yeah. So, um, someone asks. Keywords like rigid body are being called obsolete by Unity. I know it's for downwards com uh, compatibility, but how old is this? Why don't they just remove them? They also change networking stuff, so old projects don't work anymore. Why keep this old not working stuff? I think, um, yeah, that one is a tiny bit silly. I mean, what they do is they have this automatic uh, patcher that just takes all of your code and makes it use modern Unity standards. And that worked a lot when they did a big um, API change in the beginning of five, um, Unity 5. Um, I think really what they did to the API is a lot better. And so I don't use those obsolete, obsolete things anymore. It is for backwards compatibility and some people are just too used to it and need some time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not really helping me, but again, if I had a huge Unity project, I would be kind of annoyed if they didn't support it for at least um, some months or a year or so. But I'm sure they'll remove it at some point. Uh, it's also really nice for tutorial channels like my own that they keep stuff like that working, just so that when people watch a tutorial that might be a, a tiny bit dated, um, they can actually use the code. It's not just going to break and they get an error and they say, well, F this, I'm out, This I don't want to do game development. It's just a, a warning saying that you're not using it totally optimally, uh, but frankly, beginners don't care about what's optimal. So I, I actually kind of like that they support that stuff um, in terms of being able to follow along with um, with tutorials. Um, oh, you guys are giving me compliments. That's so, that's so, thank I'm so thankful for that. Um, what kind of pro products do I use for my beard? <laughs> I have a, uh, uh, I actually use nothing. Um, I don't use any kind of products. I, I use soap uh, and I trim it a bit and that's it. If it looks like I'm using product, I don't know if I need to take that as a compliment, but I'm sorry, I don't really use anything. <laughs> and uh, Sophia is laughing over here. She's having a blast. Um, so, uh, let me see what else we have. Um, do I still need a model designer? I'm actually, it's kind of an ongoing project and I'm always looking for 3D artists and it's something that I wanted to talk about here. I don't want to say what it is that I'm doing just yet, but if you are a 3D artist and have some experience, especially if you, I mean, uh, modeling and texturing experience is pretty much required. Uh, it's really nice if you can do concept art, if you know how to do character design and rigging and animation, but all of those are just plus uh, extra things that are really nice to have. But if you know how to do 3D models and have some experience, feel free to just throw me an email at apply at brackies.com. Again, apply at brackies. I'm just going to put that in the chat apply at brackies.com and um, yeah it would be super awesome to work with you guys we already have a lot of people working uh, on the project and it's just it's so much fun so feel free to uh, throw me an email right away after the uh, stream ends um, with a link and make sure you include a link to a portfolio or previous works I'm not going to um, I consider you unless you actually show me some of your work because this is an artistic thing and I need to see uh, some some work so that I know we're kind of in line in terms of, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, cool, so what else are, uh, is going on here? 
how much knowledge in C++ do I have? Um, limited amount. I know my way around C++. I can read uh, a lot of C++. I don't feel fluent, uh, but I, I feel like I know the language pretty well. But then again, C++ is such a huge language. So it's just really something that I feel that I know the surface of. Uh, but I, I can code a bit in C++, but don't hire me as a proficient C++ coder. Just just saying, don't do that. <laughs> cool. Um, do I watch The Walking Dead? Um, I have watched it. Uh, I don't anymore. I watched, I believe, three or four seasons. Um, fun show. Uh, really in a decline of quality, I think. I think the first season was really exciting. Then the second one was, nah, and then it just got worse. So I kind of lost interest. But yeah, fun show. Um, let's see what's else. What else is going on here? Um, am I planning on starting a bit more advanced series on YouTube? An RTS would be amazing. Again, I, I would say that an RTS would be really fun as well. It's just one of the most code heavy things that you can do um, at all. And I would like to do some more advanced stuff, um, but it really depends on kind of what most of my audience uh, want to see. If you guys, a lot of you guys want to see some advanced stuff, that's awesome. But in terms of uh, engagement, I feel like uh, most of you or most of my subscribers, at least, maybe not all the ones who are here, but you guys are probably more hardcore uh, than the average subscriber. But most of, uh, of the subscribers, I feel, want to see uh, more beginner-related stuff. But I, of course, want to do some advanced stuff. And, of course, we're going to do that at uh, some point. I also want to do maybe not quite as long series, but more tailored towards a specific subject. I, for a long time, I really wanted to do, like, realistic car movement. Uh, for like racing games and stuff like that. That could be so fun. So I want to create some mini series of standalone tutorials as well. And though uh, one of those might be really advanced. I mean, uh, we could look into that. Do I have any advice for young game developers? Um, I'm 14 years old. Yeah, just keep at it, man. Just keep making stuff. Um, try and um, set... Uh, realistic goals for yourself so don't try to create these huge projects where you get burned out and um, really what you learn most doing is just small finished projects even though it's maybe just something like this just getting some core uh, mechanics in there trying to make it fun and trying to make it work tuning the colors even though it feels really simple and might not have uh, AAA graphics or uh, a huge networking system or anything like that. Just try and make something that you know that you can complete because finishing a game and getting the experience of putting it out there and getting your friends to play it is one of the most important parts. I mean, it's something that you are going to need experience in if you decide to do a uh, project that's larger and will require uh, multiple years of development so that you don't make uh, mistakes on the la later stages of development and also giant kind of just to put fuel on the fire so that you don't lose interest. I mean, that would just be really, really not cool. So yeah, just practice, man. It's it's a lot of fun. Find some friends who, who want to do it with you and, and make some games with them. That's sometimes the most fun part. Um, what is programming? Uh, Jesus. Programming is getting to do computers to do stuff that you want them to do. <laughs> it's pretty much my best explanation, I think. Um, and you often have to do that by telling them really obvious and stupid things. Um, so let me see. Uh, um, how cost this uh, to call the component of an object? I assume you mean finding a component using get component or calling a function on the component that's two separate things it's not too costly unity has really optimized finding game objects and finding components uh, a lot since th they started of course it does require a tiny bit of time but really if you want to see how costly it is and it totally depends on the uh, scale of the game object if it's a huge game object with uh, 200 components it's going to be really slow uh, so they do optimize it in that way. Um, but uh, really, you can just open the profiler and have a look at how long it takes. Um, let's see. Uh, am I planning to do a 2D terrain generation series like the terrain in the 2D physics-based card game? 
Um, that wasn't actually uh, generated. That was just um, me jumping in Photoshop and creating a ridiculously large um, path and then just filling it out with color. It's only because I never showed you kind of the confines of the level that you would think that that was actually generated. I mean, if, if enough guys, uh, enough of you guys suggested, I definitely could look into that. It's kind of advanced, um, but it could also be really, really fun. So again, I, I pretty much want to do anything, guys. Um, as long as enough of you guys want to see it, um, I'm up for it. I mean, programming is fun and, and trying to do stuff that I maybe hadn't thought of myself is always uh, a challenge. So that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, next episode of Game Math Theory, when, what is about, and a quaternion explanation. Um, yeah, next episode of uh, Game Math Theory is going to come. Don't worry, it's not over. When? I don't know, when I, when I get time. Uh, the side project that I haven't told you about yet, which is the reason why I'm looking for artists, has taken up a lot of time, I'm sorry. Um, but um, I definitely want to do more Game Math Theory. I think it's probably some of the videos I have the most fun creating, but they are also hugely time uh um huge time swallowers i mean it took me about five to six seven times as long to do just one of those videos as a normal video so it's it's really a lot but and um, what is it about i have some ideas quaternions might be in there that could be pretty fun i've seen a lot of you guys uh suggested but also quaternions is a more difficult subject than uh, what uh, some of the other uh videos entail and it kind of requires some understanding of some fields that I don't feel like I've covered yet. So I might want to do other videos first, and then we can always look into quaternions later, but I'm still figuring that out. It depends on how much I can feel like I can squeeze into a video without having it be like too much to, to follow along with. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Uh... Can I make a multiplayer RPG? Again, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be making a multiplayer RPG. It's simply too heavy, both when it comes to code, when it comes to art, sound, everything in a multiplayer RPG is, oh, it just requires a lot. I mean, maybe. Not a massively online multiplayer RPG, that's for sure. Maybe an RPG maybe multiplayer i don't know i don't want to say never i mean if all of you guys just suddenly started saying make a multiplayer uh, rpg you would have one tomorrow no, i'm kidding I, I wouldn't be able to do that but i would definitely do my best to to kind of cram everything i could into a tutorial uh, what was my first programming language my first um non-visual programming language was on uh, visual basic i uh, didn't like it not one bit um, I also tried to kind of read some Python because I played around with the uh, Blender game engine and that had some visual scripting, but also uh, also Python. Uh, but yeah, the first programming language that I really fell in love with was uh, was JavaScript, and then C Sharp is is now my I feel like my main main language. Um, make a MOBA in the next live stream? Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, in the project, do I need animators and riggers? Um, yeah, I mean, not as many as I need, uh, modelers and, and people who can texture. Uh, but if you feel like you want to be part and, uh, if you're, I mean, I, it would have to be combined. So you would have to know both rigging and animation. I wouldn't include just an animator or just a rigger, unfortunately, because, um, we work in smaller teams. And so, yeah, uh, we would have to. Uh, you would have to know both. Um, do I need low poly or detailed 3D models? I actually need um, both. So yeah, you can just submit and show me your work and I will let you know if, if it works. <laughs> um, any advice on starting a YouTube channel? That's interesting. This is not the sort of thing that you guys normally ask me. Um, yeah, do I have any advice? I think the greatest advice is kind of figuring out your niche is figuring out who is actually going to be interested in these videos and once you have that who how are they actually going to discover it i mean it's it's too core question and it, it might sound obvious but i i think a lot of people find 
uh, make some really, really interesting videos. And I follow a lot of uh, YouTubers who make awesome content, but the problem is that no one is discovering it. And that's the whole thing with tutorials is uh, you could go out and make a how to make a multiplayer FPS series, or you could go make an how to make a cyberpunk RPG FPS um, f for uh, beginners only and uh, that targets a certain amount. You want it to be as specific or as general as possible, but while without being, well, annoying. You still want to answer the questions that you say in the title, but uh, not use clickbait. I don't do that at least. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, you want to kind of figure out something that people will actually be searching for, especially if you do tutorials, you want people to discover it through search. So yeah, but again, I'm not the one to give YouTube advice. I mean, I'm a tutorial maker more than I feel like I'm a YouTuber. So yeah. Um, yeah, so how would you find multiple game objects with a specific tag in a range? Yeah, uh, game game object that find game objects with tag will give you an array of all of the game objects with a specific tag. Then you need to sort through that array, so loop through it um, with a for or for each loop. And then you want to check the distance from your current object to that object. And uh, if it's greater than your range, discard it. If it's less than the range, well, then you can use that. So that's that's how you do it. It's not performant, but it's hard to get that stuff really, uh, really fast. Um, uh, dee -dee -dee -dee, dee -dee -dee -dee. Oh, I'm try uh, having a really hard time uh, keeping up with all the questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Advice for turn-based fighting system. I've never created a turn-based fighting system. I'm sorry, that's not something I have experience in. So I wouldn't really know um, any specific advice for this genre. Uh, yeah. Um, RPG game basics will be awesome. I mean, that could be really fun. I mean, we can definitely do something with... Um, some RPG basic mechanics. That's totally possible. Again, it quickly becomes very feature heavy, these RPGs and very content heavy, especially. Uh, but we could stick to the basics and just get something working on there. That's totally possible. Even make it multiplayer, but that adds some development time. Um, yeah. Do I understand shaders? Depends on the uh, shading, shader language, but I feel like I... I uh, know most of what it requires to um, write and understand shaders. Uh, but really, it's really nice that uh, Unity standard shader does so much now. I feel like it does really 90, maybe even 95% of what I need when, when creating graphics for um, for a game, for a 3D game. Um, there's just so many texture maps, so many settings. I mean, it's PBR, so that's awesome. Um, if you don't know, PBR stands for physically based rendering, and it basically means that you calculate how the light um, actually interacts with the object based on properties that you would find in real life, like roughness, roughness, metallicness, um, and stuff like that, color, emission. Uh, and uh, the really cool thing about that is when you have PBR um, rendered materials and textures, um, you can take one object, make it look awesome in one scene and one lighting condition, and then take it into another scene in another lighting condition, and it will still look great because we're actually calculating it based on real values and not just ba based on some made up hacky way. So yeah, uh, it looks a lot better. Um, yeah, so... I think we're kind of getting to the end of the stream now. I am, <clears throat> my voice is almost giving up. And um, also I feel like um, we've covered a lot. So if you have any final questions, ask away now. We'll just take a few more minutes. I had so much fun, guys, really. Um, I think uh, the result of the game, it turned out uh, awesome. And again, this will be on the YouTube channel. It will be Im uh, immediately available as a Twitch archive and um, it will also, um, yeah, the project will also be uploaded to GitHub. So that's, um, yeah, you have all of it there accessible afterwards in case you missed something. So let me just see the final questions here. 
Um, can you add player teams to your multiplayer FPS projects and modes like CTF and Team Deathmatch? Um, that would be interesting. It also requires a lot of code changing, so I might not do that uh, right now. Just thinking about what it will require. At least I have some things that I want to do first. I want to do weapon switching. Uh, it's a really important one. Also kind of wanted to do a sniper with scope and stuff like that. Um, also wanted to add some more weapons. So yeah, uh, I have some other things that I want to do first. How about NPCs in the multiplayer FPS? I think if I'm going to do something with NPCs and AI, it should be for a separate video because uh, NPCs and pathfinding and stuff like that is really, um, it's really quite, I mean, if you're just going to have someone uh, follow the player, just have an enemy follow the player and use pathfinding, it's really a general thing. You can you can reuse th those sorts of scripts in a lot of different places, and I don't think it's too specific for the multiplayer FPS, especially because you know all you need to do to make it network is put a uh, transform component on it or network transform, and it will synchronize. Or you could have them move independently. So, yeah, I think that uh, I, that's not going. Uh, it's not highest on the priority list. But again, just suggest it i'll write it down i keep track of what you guys suggest and i'll uh, figure out what we should do next um brackets would you consider doing a new a sharp algorithm series that's more adjustable i know there are a few but they all have some flaws totally true uh i would definitely consider that if a lot of you guys want to see um that was just what i was touching on as well i mean a star path pathfinding is, is awesome and it's really easy um to use i also know that um Sebastian Lake has some awesome uh, videos on scripting, uh, pathfinding and stuff like that uh, yourself. I think he both has using a library like A star and also from scratch, but you can check that out, uh, Sebastian Lake. So yeah, shout out to him. He makes awesome content. Um, yeah, so I guess we will uh, wrap up the stream right here. Thank you so much to all of the um, people who were here and to those of you viewing afterwards. I had so much fun, really successful stream. And thank you to all of the guys asking questions and stuff like that. If you have a burning question you don't feel like was answered, you can go to forum.brackies.com, make a post there. Um, there are a lot of awesome you guys, some of them in here, uh, who um, is ready to answer your questions. And uh, I'm also on there once in a while i'm sorry if i don't spend too much there but um i do have a youtube channel to make videos for or you guys will get really mad so yeah later tonight um i think i'm uh, gonna have a new video up so that's awesome and also i just wanted to mention that i am on a fixed video schedule now so that means that wednesdays and sundays is when i upload new videos so if you don't see a video on Wednesday, on Sunday, ping me, let me know what's going on or ask what's going on because then there's something wrong. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching this stream. I had a blast. If you want to support the streams and uh, support the videos and all that, you can go to patreon.com slash brackies. That's what makes, what makes this whole thing possible. You can donate a monthly amount so recurring donations and you can cancel them at any time and get some rewards as well it's so awesome that you guys are donating on there thank you so much to all the people who are already donating and to the people who might donate when we're done here so yeah that's totally optional and uh, thanks guys i'll see you soon bye Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in November, and a special thanks to Sultan Al Sharif, Faisal Marafai, James Calhoun, and Robert Bonham. Become a patron yourself at patreon.com/brackies. 